G'day, Internet. I, my name is Jason Zabalo, and this is a Catholic Social Democrats vlog. Welcome back to my channel, or if this is your first time here, welcome to my channel. It's Tuesday, at least it's Tuesday here in Australia, and I plan to make Tuesdays on this channel Apologetics Tuesdays. Now, in case you're wondering, apologetics doesn't mean saying sorry for something. Apologetics means the reason defense of something. And since I'm a Catholic, I'm talking here about the reason defense of Catholicism. Now, I want to, for this first Apologetics Tuesday, to reply to a video made by a young Presbyterian YouTuber by the name of Redeem Zuma. Redeem Zuma has made a video called Why Sola Scriptura is True. And yeah, as I said, I want to reply to that. Now, I have to say, Radid Zuba, I don't know his real name, but I've seen a number of his videos. He's obviously a very intelligent person and a very committed Christian and very well read in theology, not just in the theology of his own Presbyterian tradition, but in a broad stretch of historical Christian theology. He seems like the kind of person that I could sit down with over several beers and have a lot of fun discussing theology, philosophy, and whatever else. He seems like a good person, and I'm quite certain he means well. But in this video, Why Sola Scriptura is True, I think he makes a number of fairly bad arguments. Now, what is Sola Scriptura? Well, it's one of the fundamental differences between Catholic and Protestant Christians, but let me allow Redeem Zuma to explain to you to himself what Sola Scriptura means. We are talking about Sola Scriptura, which is Latin for the Bible alone. This doesn't mean that the Bible is our only authority. It does mean that the Bible is our only infallible authority, which means it's our highest authority that all other lesser authorities must submit to. There is no authority that is equal to or higher than the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God. That is what Sola Scriptura means. And I'm going to... Now, I just want to add to what Radim Zuma is saying here a little bit about the Catholic position because Radim Zuma says that the Protestant position is that the, the Bible is the only infallible authority and that obviously is the the Protestant position, and then he says there is nothing on an equal level with the Bible. Now, it's important to understand that for Catholics, certain acts of what we call the Catholic magisterium are infallible. We believe the Pope, under certain circumstances, has the power to teach infallibly, meaning that he is protected from error, and also that general councils of bishops teaching in union with the Pope have the power to teach infallibly. And that's again, meaning that they cannot err. But it's important to know that that doesn't mean that these things are on, le on level with Scripture. So Paul says with regards to the Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Scriptures, because they are breathed out by God, are not merely going to be infallible. They are going to be positively useful. They are going to have things of value for us. Now, the teachings of the Pope and the teachings of church councils, they have a purely negative infallibility. They cannot teach error. They cannot say something that is wrong, but they can say something that is incomplete or they can say something that is just useless or worthless. They are not breathed out by God, and so they are not on the level of Scripture. So we would actually agree with our Protestant friends that the teaching of the church are not on the level of Scripture, although we disagree with them that we think these things are infallible. And it's also important to understand that papal infallibility and the infallibility of church councils restricted to very definite acts of the Pope and the Council. It's not as if everything the Pope says is infallible. Uh, there's a great Catholic novel called Brides Have Revisited, which if you haven't read, you really should, um, which kind of makes this point in a somewhat satirical way. And it sort of asks, you know, if the Pope 
you know, woke up and said it's going to rain today, would that be infallible? Would it be guaranteed to rain? Well, no, it isn't. The Pope is infallible in certain very narrowly defined areas spelt out by the First Vatican Council, and you can look at the decree of the First Vatican Council if you want more after about this. Anyway, Rudin Zuba gives three arguments in response to support Sola Scriptura, and I want to look at these one at a time. That's a very Protestant idea, that sin affects everything, and if sin affects everything, then sin also affects the church. And if sin affects the church, then that means the church is not infallible. The church still has authority. The Bible gives authority to a lot of other things apart from the Bible. The Bible says parents have authority over their children. The Bible says the government has authority over you. You hear that, libertarians? Yes, the Bible says to submit to the government, Romans 13. But it's not claiming that the government is infallible. Uh, the Bible says submit to your parents. It does not mean that your parents are infallible. The government clearly does make mistakes. Your parents can make mistakes. So just because God gives authority to something doesn't mean that thing is infallible. And in the Bible, God gives authority to a lot of religious leaders, but that does not make them infallible. And this is a pattern that we see all throughout the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God gives authority to Moses and Aaron, but Aaron sins and worships the golden calf, so that means Aaron was not infallible. God gives authority to the judges, but the judges regularly sin, go astray, and worship false gods. So that means the judges were not infallible. Then God gives authority to the kings, but the kings go astray and worship false gods. So that means the kings were not infallible. Okay, so first thing, Redeem Zuma keeps saying that the kings and the judges and the priests of Israel sinned. And yes, the Bible is quite clear on that. They did all sin and that therefore they are fallible. No, that just logically doesn't follow. The ability to sin is called peccability. The ability, the ability to teach, teach wrongly is called fallibility. They're not the same thing. And there is no reason to think that one logically implies the other. Other. A person can sin and still be protected by God from teaching error. So this repeated refrain of Rabin Zuba that they sinned, therefore they were fallible, just doesn't follow logically. But the second and I think more important problem with Rabin Zuba's argument here is that if it proves anything, it proves too much. He keeps saying that, you know, church leaders are, are sinful and therefore fallible. Well, the Bible was written by men. Now, I do believe it is the word of God. These men were guided by the Spirit to make sure that what they said was true. But they were still men. If you look at the Bible, you will see clearly that, you know, there are the epistles of Paul and the gospel according to Matthew and Mark and Luke. These, the, these, the books of scripture were written by men. And it's not as if they, you know, went into a trance and just recorded the words dictated by the Holy Spirit. They were, you know, you can see, for instance, that the writing styles of the individual men who wrote the Bible clearly influenced you know, are clearly there. They, the different Bible writers have different writing styles, which is clear if you read the books. So, yes, the Bible is the word of God, but it is also the writings of men. And were these men sinful or were they not? Well, to anyone familiar with the scriptures knows the answer to that. St. Peter sins very badly. There are a number of his sins recorded in Scripture. St. Paul repeatedly tells us what a sinful man he was and cries out to be rescued from his body of sin. So, yeah, the writers of the Bible were sinners. Now, as I said, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. But you have to ask, if the Holy Spirit can guide men, so that the sinful men can write an infallible Bible, why can the whole same Holy Spirit not guide sinful men like the popes and the bishops of the Catholic Church to give an infallible magisterium? As I said, 
the level of guidance of the Holy Spirit is lower in magisterial teachings than it is in Scripture. So if the Holy Scripture, so hold, sorry, if the Holy Spirit can inspire Scripture, it should be a less a miracle than that for the Holy Spirit to guarantee that when the Pope, for instance, writes something ex cathedra, that it is guarded from error. So really, Redeem Zuma's argument doesn't hold up here. Now, let's look at his second argument. Okay, next reason. Basically, all arguments against Sola Scriptura could have been used by the Pharisees to argue against Christ. Um, here is the biggest example of that. The number one argument against Sola Scriptura is the question of the canon, the canon of scripture, because as you guys know, as I, as I hope you guys know, the Bible does not contain a table of contents in the beginning. It's not like uh, before Genesis 1, um, God says, okay, these are all the books that should be included in your Bible, so make sure you take a note of this. That's not what happened. There is no table of contents in the Bible. So how do we know which books belong in the Bible? So what the Catholic and Orthodox people will say is, oh yeah, you need to rely on church tradition to um, for your canon of scripture because church tradition assembled the Bible and gave you the Bible, so um, that means you must submit to our church because without our church you wouldn't have your Bible that you love so much. That's what they say. And they are absolutely right that we depend on church tradition for the canon of scripture. However, that does not mean church tradition is infallible. God can use a fallible authority to deliver you an infallible document. Here's an example, like let's say you submit to a king and the king has authority over you. The king's messengers don't have authority over you, but you could still trust the king's messengers to deliver you messages from the king. So, of course, God is the king, and the message that he is delivering is the Bible, and the messenger that is delivering that message is the church, church tradition. Another example is your pastor preaches the word of God to you. Your pastor delivers the Bible to you when he preaches the word of God to you. That does not mean your pastor has the same authority as the word of God just because he delivers the word of God to you. But they'll still say, oh, there's a difference between normative authority and existential authority. Um, you still need to you still need to give a, a infallible authority to the church if you trust the church to produce an infallible document for you. But here's the thing. Jesus depended on the religious authorities, the religious traditions of his day, for his canon of scripture. Jesus' canon of scripture was the Old Testament. And just like the New Testament doesn't have a table of contents, neither does the Old Testament. So how did people in Jesus' time know which books were part of the Old Testament canon? They relied on they relied on the Jewish traditions of their time to know which books belong in the Old Testament, which for them was just their Bible. And the the gatekeepers, the keepers of the uh, the keepers of the Jewish tradition, were largely the Pharisees. However, if you read absolutely any part of the Gospels at all, Jesus clearly did not think the Pharisees had infallible authority. However, Jesus still recognized that the Pharisees had some authority. Jesus. Now, this you know comparison of a messenger and the messenger having authority this is a reasonably common protestant argument um i don't think it holds up i th could think you could use that argument if if from the early centuries of the christian era it was really clear that we had an agreed upon canon but the fact of the matter is we don't if you look at the early centuries after the apostles died out no one seems to have had the same New Testament canon that we have today. The earliest example of a New Testament of the New Testament canon being written out with the exact 27 books that we today recognize as the New Testament canon was by St. Athanasius of Alexandria uh, several hundred years after the death of the last apostle. So I think you can't say that there's, you know, a clear tradition that was followed 
the, the church handed down of the New Testament. And I think if we're going to say that we have a reliable New Testament, we really have to say that the church is infallible and that the church infallibly defined which books make up the canon. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. He talks about, you know, Jesus, you know, expecting the, the Pharisees, of expecting people to believe what was in the Old Testament. But did he, in fact? Now, as you're probably aware, there were two major factions of Jews at the times of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees believed in the broad Old Testament canon. I mean, obviously, they didn't call it the Old Testament, but they believed in the law, the prophets, and the writings. But the Sadducees only believed in the five books of Moses. Now, you'll notice when Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees, he holds the Pharisees to what is in all the books that the Pharisees regarded as scripture. But when he's arguing with the Sadducees, he doesn't seem to do this. He only seems to hold the Sadducees to what is in the five books of Moses, the five first books of what Christians call the Old Testament. So it seems to me that Jesus isn't actually, you know, working on the basis that anyone will know for certain what the New Testament is. Sorry, what the Old Testament is. Big mistake there. Um, it seems to me, in fact, that what he does is with each, when each group, when he deals with them and debates them, he holds them only to the books that that group held as canonical. So he wasn't working on the assumption that there was would be infallible knowledge of what the Old Testament scriptures were. Now, let's turn to his third argument. And that brings me to the third argument for Sola Scriptura, and it's that everyone kind of already believes in it in some way. And let me explain, even if you're Catholic or Orthodox. So, the Catholics claim, you know, the Bible is not the only infallible authority, our church is also an infallible authority. However, if the church is the infallible authority, then only one church body can have that infallible authority. So, the Catholics claim, we are the infallible church, all of you other churches split from us. The Orthodox will claim, no, 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 we are the infallible church, all of you guys split from us. And the Oriental Orthodox will then go and claim, no, we are the infallible authority, all of you guys split from us. And then the Assyrian Church of the East will go, no, 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 we are the infallible authority, all you guys split from us. You guys see where this is going, right? They all claim to be the infallible authority that everyone else split from. So if you have different churches that claim to be the one true church founded by Jesus and the apostles, and different churches can really claim apostolic succession back to the early church, how do you know which one is correct? How do you know which church split from which if they both have basically equally credible historical claims to having been rooted in the original church? You need to appeal to the Bible. You need to see which church's claims are more biblical. This is what we call private judgment. Private judgment means figuring out truth for yourself rather than having someone else do it for you. And, you know, Catholics and Orthos will attack Protestants for using private judgment, for having private interpretations of scripture. But the thing is, Catholics and Orthodox people, uh, they do that too. You know, if you converted to Catholicism and or or Orthodoxy, you relied on your own reasoning to discern which of those two churches was really the one true church, because they both claim to be the one true church. So you either had to rely on your own private judgment, or you search the scriptures to see which of those churches follows the Bible more closely. And if you're doing so, if you're judging church authority by the authority of the Bible, then congrats, you believe in sola scriptura and you should be a Protestant. Now, some of them, and this is where I say everyone believes in sola scriptura in some sense, some of them will say, oh no, we, did, we don't appeal to the Bible alone to see which church is the true one. We see which one follows the earliest tradition. So for example, I, I talked about the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. Those churches split in the 5th century at the Council of Chalcedon. 
The Council of Chalcedon was where the church split into the Chalcedonians that affirmed the council and the Miaphysites that denied and rejected the council. Why did they reject the council? Because they said the Council of Chalcedon was contradicting the previous council, which is the Council of Ephesus. And then the Chalcedonian side was like, no, we're not ca contradicting Ephesus. We're affirming what Ephesus said. You guys are contradicting Ephesus. So basically, the fight between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox is which one of them agreed with the earlier tradition. So they're establishing this principle that earlier traditions need to be appealed to when you have a dispute over which later tradition is correct. The question is, okay, which tradition is more in line with the earlier tradition? And similarly, the Council of Ephesus, the earlier one, that was where the Nestorians split from everyone else. And the argument there was, okay, which one of us agrees more with the Council of Nicaea, which is an even earlier tradition than the Council of Ephesus? And at the Council of Nicaea, that's where all of the Christians split from the Arians, the people following Arius. And the debates at the Council of Nicaea were which side follows the Bible. Because the Bible is an earlier tradition than all of the church councils. All these churches that claim to be the one true church, Catholics, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, sorry, sorry not Protestants, Protestants don't claim to be the one true church. All these churches that claim to be the one true church, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, and the Assyrian Church of the East, they all accept a different set of councils. So how do you know which set of councils is the correct set of councils? You need to appeal to the scriptures, because all the scriptures came before the councils. Yes, you could say they were maybe canonized and assembled after some of those councils, but the scriptures are an older authority than any of the church councils. And that basically proves sola scriptura, because you are saying that older traditions are more authoritative than newer ones, so therefore the Bible is more authoritative than any church council, because you need to privately judge which church councils are correct using the Bible, because different church bodies will accept different numbers of councils. And this was also a general principle even in the Old Testament. Generally, even though the, the writings of the prophets were considered scripture, they were still subject to the writings of the law, the law of Moses. And even though like the Psalms and the Proverbs, the writings, um, they were still subject to the authority of the law and the prophets. So like the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, they, they were sort of like, you know, um, a planet with, like, the core being the law of Moses, being the Torah, the mantle being, you know, the prophets, and the crust being, like, the writings. So there's always been this principle that older revelation is more authoritative than newer stuff. And here's, I think, my favorite biblical example of sola scriptura actively being employed in the Bible. There, were, there was a group called the Bereans, Basically, in the book of Acts, they tested what the apostles were saying according to the Old Testament scriptures that they already had. They now, I have to say, this is his most interesting argument, this idea that everyone accepts sola scriptura in some way. But if you look at it, you see it's kind of flawed because he acknowledges... <coughs> pardon me. He acknowledges that, you know, the when the Old Testament was still in the process of being revealed, the scriptures, the new revelation was held up and measured against the old revelation. And he cites the Bereans. But the fact that the Old Testament revelation, the, sorry, the, the New Testament revelation was judged by the Bereans against the existing scripture didn't prevent the New Testament scripture from being infallible. So in the same way, I think Redeem Zuber is right. You, do, you should, to a certain extent, judge the teachings of the magisterium against scripture. But just as the fact that the Bereans, judging this new revelation against the texts of the Old Testament, didn't stop the New Testament being infallible, in the same way, the fact that we can judge the teachings of the magisterium against scripture doesn't stop the teachings of the magisterium from being infallible. So all up, Redeem Zuma has given us three arguments 
And I think I've shown that none of those arguments actually hold logical muster. So sincere thanks to Dean Zuma for putting his arguments out there, but I think Catholics are right to reject them and to continue to hold to an infallible magisterium. Thanks to everyone who has watched this video for watching it through. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to say. I hope you've learned something. If you have found this interesting, please give this video a like. That helps me out a lot. Click subscribe to get more video content like this from me. Again, that helps me a lot. If you really want to help me out, leave a comment below. Um, comments, are, or comments in the comment section are always really helpful. Uh, please pray for me. Please pray for the success of this channel. I promise I will be praying regularly for all my channel's viewers. Thank you very much and God bless.